Hello, Namaskar. This is First Post, and you're watching Vantage with me, Palki Sharma. It was budget day in India, the first budget of Prime Minister Modi's third term. The focus was on jobs and allies. We'll bring you the highlights, talk about what's in it for the women of the country and why budgets must focus on women. Also, how you, the taxpayer, remain the golden goose for every government. And what was the verdict on the budget? Well, it was delivered emphatically and colourfully by the markets and the memes. We'll bring you all of it. In the United States, Kamala Harris has got the delegates and the donors. Can she beat Donald Trump now? How China has brokered a deal between the two warring factions of Palestine, Hamas and Fateh, and what it means for Beijing's profile and America's role in West Asia. Why the European Union is at odds with Hungary. Why Ugandans are facing a crackdown. How come sharks have cocaine in their bodies and what should be the ideal age of retirement? China is debating that question. We'll bring you all of that and more. The headlines first. U.S. Secret Service Director Kimberly Cheetal resigns. It comes a day after she was grilled by a congressional committee. The lawmakers questioned her over the agency's failure to prevent the assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Cheetal called the attack the biggest operational failure of the Secret Service in decades. In India, the Supreme Court refuses to cancel the national eligibility come entrance test or NEET for undergraduates, saying that there is no material proof to show systemic breach. The court stated that a retest will affect more than 20 lakh students. Major irregularities were discovered in this year's exam, which was held in the month of May. Amid rising Hindu phobia in Canada, another temple vandalized in the country. A Swami Narayan temple was defaced with anti-India graffiti in Edmonton. Last year, Khalistanis targeted at least three temples across Canada. China and Russia defend their policies in the Arctic and slam the U.S. Washington has raised an alarm over Beijing and Moscow's increased cooperation. In recent years, Russia has beefed up its military presence in the Arctic, while China has poured a lot of money into polar exploration and research. A landslide in Ethiopia kills more than 140 people. The disaster occurred after heavy rains in Gofa. Ethiopia is the second most populous country in Africa. It is highly vulnerable to climate disasters like flooding and drought. And Andy Murray confirms his retirement after the Paris Olympics. The 37-year-old is a two-time Olympic champion. Murray will play in the singles and doubles at his fifth games. The Scot has played with a metal hip since 2019. India's union budget is out. The first budget of the Modi government's third term, Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman presented it and with it, she set a record today. It was her seventh consecutive budget speech, the most by any finance minister in this country, the seventh. In February, she had delivered an interim budget applicable till the elections were held and a new government was formed, hence the term interim, that's why it's called the interim budget. That budget had no major reforms or no significant policy changes, which was an expected lines. But today's budget, unexpectedly, follows the same trend. The focus is on the fundamentals and there's an attempt to address pressing challenges. India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi said, it empowers all sections of the society. In the last 10 years, 25 crore people गरीबी से बाहर निकले हैं ये जो नियम मिडिल क्लास बना है ये बजट उनके सशक्तिकरण की निरंतरता का बजट है इन नौजवानों को अनगिनत नए अवसर देने वाला बजट है सो व्हाट डू वी मेक ऑफ दिस बजट the speech was 86 minutes long, among the shortest by Nirmala Sitaraman. Her longest was two hours and 40 minutes in 2020. But coming back to today, 86-minute long budget, we put together 10 highlights for you. 
Number one, jobs. Undoubtedly the buzzword for today. The finance minister brought it up 33 times in her speech. After all, job creation is one of the biggest challenges that India faces right now. It was also a key election issue. So the budget speech focused on it, as did the budget allocations. The government will spend $24 billion on job creation in India over the next five years. We particularly focus on employment, skilling, MSMEs and the middle class. I'm happy to announce the Prime Minister's package of five schemes and initiatives to facilitate employment, skilling and other opportunities for 4.1 crore youth over a five-year period. $24 billion or 2 lakh crore rupees. Where will this money go? To three new programs, a paid part internship, a skilling scheme, and an incentive plan. For the paid internship, the government plans to rope in India's top 500 companies. They will be encouraged to hire paid interns. An intern will get an allowance of 5,000 rupees per month. That's about $60, 5,000 rupees a month, plus a one-time assistance of 6,000 rupees, which is around 70 US dollars. And who will pay this? Who will foot the bill? The companies from their CSR budget. CSR is corporate social responsibility. So the companies will pay for the scheme. The government says 100 million Indian youth will benefit from it. The second program is a skilling scheme. It will offer loans for upskilling. Again, this is targeted at the youth. Candidates can avail loans of up to 7.5 lakh rupees. This will be facilitated by the government. It's a loan. The third program is an incentive plan, a direct benefit transfer of sorts to encourage freshers joining the workforce. They will get one month's salary or up to 15,000 rupees, whichever is higher. This money will be deposited to their pension accounts. Over 2 million freshers could benefit from this. This scheme will provide one month wage to all persons newly entering the workforce in all formal sectors. Direct benefit transfer of one month salary in three installments to first time employees. So those are the three programs on jobs. Highlight number two is about education. A total of 1.48 lakh crore rupees have been allocated for education, employment and skilling initiatives. That's 1.8 billion US dollars. This is for internships, target programs for job seekers and higher education. The government plans to facilitate loans of up to 10 lakh rupees for 100,000 students. For helping our youth who have not been eligible for any benefit under government schemes and policies, I am happy to announce a financial support for loans up to 10 lakh rupees for higher education in domestic institutions. Highlight number three is defense. Defense has got the highest allocation among all government ministries. This year's defense budget is 6.22 lakh crores. That's more than 74 billion US dollars. The government will spend more on border infrastructure, at least 30% more now. The allocation is 738 million dollars. And border infra, remember, is also a strategic asset. This helps boost India's defense capability. Highlight number four is that it's a coalition budget. The BJP's top partners in the government are the Telugu Desam Party or the TDP from Andhra Pradesh and the Janata Dal United or JDU from Bihar. Andhra Pradesh and Bihar, these two states have got significant allocations. 26,000 crores for road projects in Bihar, that's about $3 billion for airports, medical colleges and sports infrastructure in the state as well. What about Andhra Pradesh? It will get 15,000 crores to develop Amravati, which is its capital city. That's around $1.79 billion. So the NDA allies are being kept happy. Highlight number five, the budget for the Ministry of External Affairs. It's 22,000 crore rupees or $2 billion. A big chunk of this is for financial assistance to India's partner countries. Bhutan gets the biggest share as always. 
They'll get $240 million. Bangladesh's allocation has seen a dip from $24 million last year to $14 million this year. Same with Mauritius and Myanmar. Budget cuts for them. Sri Lanka and Nepal will get more money this time. And no change for the Maldives. They will get over $47 million. An allocation for the Chabahar port in Iran remains unchanged at around $11 million. So that was about the government's expenditures. Now let's talk about how the government earns the taxes. That's highlight number six. Critical minerals. Big relief on this front. 25 critical minerals have been exempted from custom duties. This includes cobalt, copper, lithium and other rare earth elements. All of these are used to make electronics and chips. Earlier they had an import duty of anywhere between 25 to 10%. But now they don't. Clearly, the government is incentivizing production in these high-tech sectors. Highlight number seven, gold, silver and platinum are set to get cheaper. Also, mobile phones, accessories and chargers, their import taxes have been reduced. Highlight number eight is income tax. Some changes here. Standard deduction has been hiked from 50 to 75,000 in the new income tax regime. The finance minister has also ordered a complete review of the Income Tax Act. As a result of these proposals, review of about 30, revenue of about 37,000 crore, that is 29,000 crore in direct taxes and 8,000 crore in indirect taxes will be foregone, while revenue of about 30,000 crore rupees will be additionally mobilized. Highlight number nine, increase in capital gains taxes. Both short-term and long-term investments from stocks to land and property are affected. You'll now have to pay more tax on your profits from these instruments. The government has hiked the capital gains tax across the board. Short-term gains on certain financial assets shall henceforth attract a tax rate of 20%, while that on all other financial assets and all non-financial assets shall continue to attract the applicable tax rate. Long-term gains on all financial and non-financial assets, on the other hand, will attract a tax rate of 12.5%. Obviously, the markets did not like it. Both the Sensex and Nifty closed in the red today. Finally, highlight number 10. The government has abolished the angel tax. And this is a major relief for startups. Those who raise money from individual investors or angel investors. Now, startups won't have to pay any tax on angel investments. So those were the top 10 highlights. Now let's dig deeper and look at the fine print. Our government's commitment for enhancing women's role in economic development. This budget had four focus groups, the poor, the youth, the farmers, and finally, women. Let's focus on the last group, women. What does this budget mean for the women of India? The government already has a number of schemes for them, so it's all about the allocation. How much money has been set aside? This time, around 3 lakh crore rupees, which is $36 billion. This money, $36 billion, will be spent on women empowerment, on their health, on education, and on skilling. The finance minister made some specific points too. She focused on women's participation in the workforce. Participation of women in the workforce. We will facilitate higher participation of women in the workforce through setting up of working women hostels in collaboration with industry and establishing creches. In addition, the partnership will seek to organize women-specific skilling programs and promotion of market access for women SHG enterprises. That's one focus area setting up working women's hostels. Another focus area, as she said, is self-help groups or SHGs.
Now, these are basically small groups of 15 odd people, mostly women. They come together, they pool their resources, often produce handmade goods, and strive to improve their lives. Many of these self help groups or SHGs are a lifeline for Indian women. So, the government wants to help them, give more market access to their products. A third focus is ownership of property. The finance minister had a message to state governments. Reduce stamp duty on assets bought by women. What does that mean? Stamp duty is a tax on property. When you buy or sell property, you must pay stamp duty. The finance minister says reduce it for women. And why is that? To encourage female ownership. The men in families tend to monopolize land. So the idea is to break that monopoly to incentivize women ownership. And this is very important, a very important issue in India. Because land is a building block of growth. You need land for loans, you need land for houses, for a small factory or production setup. You also need land for political power. Look at this report by the World Bank. I'm quoting, strong, properly enforced land rights can boost growth, reduce poverty, strengthen human capital, promote economic fairness, including gender equity and support social progress more broadly. So land rights are very important. But Indian women have long been denied land rights. Look at these numbers. Around 62% Indian men own a house. And among women, just 42%. And out of this, only 13% own the house alone. Only 13% women. The remaining 29% own it jointly with someone else. Now we come to land. Around 43% men in India own a piece of land. What about women? It's just 31%. Now you may think the situation is worse in rural India, but that's not the case. 36% of rural women own land, but only 23% of urban women do. So your so-called city dwellers are actually worse off. Of course, stamp duty alone will not solve this. You need a comprehensive strategy, some legal tweaks, some cultural reforms, and more education. That's the only way to improve women's land ownership. But why is this issue so important? And I don't mean just land. I mean the benefits for women. Why do budgets focus specifically on them? For three broad reasons. Number one is social justice. Centuries of patriarchy have created massive gender gaps in wages, in health care, and in opportunities. So every government has a responsibility to address that. Enter the budget. You can create targeted schemes for women, you can set aside more money, and most importantly, you can spell out priorities. So that's one reason. Reason number two, the economic benefits. Women make up almost half of India's population, yet very few make it to the workforce. It's like fighting with one hand tied behind your back. Obviously, you won't win. And that's what India is doing. Look at the rate of female participation in the workforce in this country. It was 24% at the time of independence. It rose to 33% by 1972. It remained constant for decades. Then it plunged to 23% in 2017 and then rose again to 37% last year. So look at the period from 1972 to 2024. Half a century to go from 33 to 37%, which is completely unacceptable. And in case you're wondering, the rate of men's participation, men's labor participation, is almost 77%. So we must address this urgently. If not, India's job problem will persist. Which brings us to reason number three, why focusing on women is important. Politics. Women make up half of all votes. They don't vote as a single political bloc, but I'm sure incentives help. Consider the 2019 Lok Sabha elections. The BJP won a landslide victory, and one reason for that was the overwhelming support from women. No complaints, though. Whatever the motivation, whatever the reason, women empowerment should be a priority for all parties because it is not just a gender issue, it is a national issue. Now we want to talk to the Indian taxpayer or rather the people who pay income tax. Almost all Indians pay taxes. Every time we buy something, there's always the eternal goods and services tax or GST waiting to take a cut. So almost every Indian pays taxes. But not all Indians pay taxes twice. 
that special privilege is reserved for about 2% of the population. For those of us in the salaried class, we have the honor of supporting the nation twice over, thanks to taxes, directly deducted from our salaries. And then again, when we pay GST on anything and everything. So to the income taxpayers, how are you feeling after today's budget? Many of you would have been waiting with bated breath, eagerly watching for some relief. Well, guess what? Your wishes have been granted, albeit underwhelmingly. First, let's talk about the new tax slabs. Though there's a disclaimer here, this only applies to the new tax regime. There are two tax regimes in India, the old and the new. They operate simultaneously. People can opt for either, but the government prefers that you move to the new one, which is why they only tweak the new tax regime. And here are those much wanted, here are those much wanted tweaks. For people earning up to 3 lakh rupees per year, congratulations, your taxes remain the same at 0%. You only pay GST and a random cess on everything from oil to education to cleanliness. And that is something all of us must contribute to. But the people earning less than 3 lakhs a year can rest easy, knowing that the taxation stops there. After that, we come to the 3 to the 7 lakh bracket, 3 to 7 lakhs. Those 4 lakh additional rupees will be taxed at 5%. The rate hasn't changed, but the slab has been expanded. It's the same scenario with the new tax slab. 7 to 10 lakh rupees will be taxed at 10%. Earlier, this was for 6 to 9 lakhs. Now, income up to 10 lakhs is also taxed at 10%. The rest of the rates remain the same. Now, all of this may sound complicated, so I'll try to simplify it as much as possible. If your salary is up to 3 lakh rupees per year, not much changes for you. If it is up to 6 lakhs, nothing changes for you. But if it is above that, you get some relief. People who make 7 lakh and above now have to pay 5,000 rupees less per year. 5,000 rupees less per year, which comes to a whopping 416 rupees less per month. Quite the princely sum. It gets better for people who make 10 lakhs and more. They save 10,000 rupees every year or about 833 rupees per month. That's almost two whole 500 rupee bills extra every single month. Whatever will you do with that massive bounty? Well, you could spend it and contribute even more to GST collections or you could invest it in mutual funds or stocks or some other instrument. It's a way to increase your wealth and contribute to the government coffers yet again. Because today, both the short-term and long-term capital gains taxes were raised. The short-term capital gains tax is now 20%, up from the earlier 15%. So whatever sum you invest, if you want to cash in your earnings in under a year, one-fifth goes to the government. However, if you decide to wait, if you hold on to your investments for more than a year, you will pay the long-term capital gains tax instead. That is also up from 10% to 12.5%. So the government will pocket an eighth of your earnings. Doesn't that feel good? Knowing that you're contributing to the nation's growth every single step of the way. You see that bridge in Bihar? The one getting washed away every monsoon? Take solace in knowing that you are the one paying for it. And what about those hybrid roads slash rivers in Mumbai? You, dear income taxpayer, are the proud funder of this world-renowned infrastructure. This is the government's revenue breakup, its sources of funding. Look at the biggest contributors. 27% comes from borrowings and other liabilities. And then it is us, the income taxpayers. The 2% of us who pay income tax. We alone provide the government with 19% of its total revenue. We contribute more than corporations. They pay 17%. Income tax is at 19%. Add our GST contributions, our cut of customs duties for, for imported goods, our share of excise duties, and what do you get? About 2% of the population being bled dry to keep the country going. That, dear taxpayers, is our contribution to the country. We pay taxes when we earn money, when we spend money, and even when we invest money. Wherever we go, whatever we do, the government has one hand in our back pocket. 
So perhaps it's time to take a closer look at where your money is going and demand accountability for every fallen bridge, for every flooded road, for every collapsed airport. Because if we are paying for all of this, we might as well get our money's worth. So as the dust settled on yet another budget day, the government is busy lauding it, the opposition is busy slamming it, and India's taxpayers are back to their daily routines. They may not have gotten much, but that did not stop them from getting creative. India's middle class found solace on the internet with a twist of humor. In our next report, we bring you the reactions to budget 2024 and of course, the meme fest. As Nirmala Sitaraman entered the parliament, India's middle class were on the edge of their seats. Their eyes gleamed with hope, their ears pricked up for the sweet sound of tax cuts or even some bare minimum subsidies. But soon enough, those dreams were relegated to the realm of fantasy. The middle class got to hold the popcorn, but they're not getting to eat any. Is still in the grip of. Hey! Hey, hey, hey! Hey! The middle class are often like a middle child in a large family, underappreciated, perpetually overlooked and with no gains. The government may have introduced new tax labs, but people are asking what exactly is the difference? It's the same middle class mirage every year. There are hopes of tax cuts, of reliefs, of subsidies. The real budget isn't that creative, but the memes on the internet definitely are. For some, the budget didn't even affect them, but that didn't stop them from joining the meme fest. However, there are two states that stole the spotlight, Andhra Pradesh and Bihar. They are ruled by NDA allies and they got a significant chunk of the budget allocation and that sparked a wave of memes on social media. India's opposition was quick to notice this too. Leader of the opposition Rahul Gandhi said that Budget 2024 was aimed at appeasing cronies with no relief for the common Indian. He called it the Kursi Bachao Budget, which means saving the chair. Other opposition leaders too slammed the government for prioritising its own NDA allies and introducing a complicated tax regime. Now, कि बिहार को आंध्र प्रदेश को कुछ विशेष पैकेज या विशेष योजनाओं से जोड़ा गया है लेकिन उत्तर प्रदेश जैसा प्रदेश जो प्रधानमंत्री देता है क्या वहां के किसान के लिए कुछ बड़े फैसले हैं किसान की फसल की पैदावार उसकी कीमत के लिए क्या कोई इंतजाम है टू टैक्स रिजीम इज अ बैड आईडिया इफ यू वांट टू इंट्रोड्यूस अ न्यू टैक्स रिजीम you should have announced it well in advance and say from this financial year everybody has to move to a new tax regime. A two tax regime is unacceptable and a bad idea. It will lead to tax arbitration and people will be confused whether they should remain in the old regime or the switch over to the new regime. The Congress even called out the government for taking a leaf out of their 2024 manifesto. The party said the government's internship program was based on Congress's Pehli Nokri Pakki, which was a proposed apprenticeship program. So it's been quite a divisive budget. The opposition is slamming it for not being enough. The middle class is left in a familiar position with hopes and dreams for next year. And the internet finds itself inevitably in another wave of tweets and memes. You return home after a long day, you kick back and turn on the TV, but you can't decide what to watch. We've all been there. So let me give you a suggestion. Just watch the US election cycle. Forget Game of Thrones, forget succession. This is the real deal. Just look at the storyline.
Donald Trump got shot, Joe Biden dropped out, Kamala Harris took over, and now Republicans say Biden is dead. That's enough material for 10 seasons, but in the U.S., it's just 10 days on the campaign trail. Let's look at the latest episode. Kamala Harris is gaining momentum. She's been reaching out to Democratic delegates. All of them had promised to support Biden, so Harris needs to sway them. And looks like she's already done it. You need 1,976 delegates to snatch the party nomination. Kamala Harris has more than 2,600. The next step is the convention. It is scheduled for the 19th of August in Chicago. If these numbers hold, Kamala Harris will be the nominee. Talk about a swift turnaround. Biden dropped out on Sunday and Harris has hit her target on Tuesday. The question is how? A, because she had Biden's endorsement, so those delegates had an easy choice, and B, because of the party elite. More and more top Democrats are endorsing Harris. The latest is Nancy Pelosi. She is the former Speaker of the U.S. House, also a very powerful figure in the Democratic Party. So the nomination now won't be a problem for Kamala Harris. It's already in the bag. Which brings us to the election. Can she beat Donald Trump? On Monday, Harris spoke at the Democratic campaign office. Her first campaign speech after taking over from Biden, everyone was looking out for clues. And they got one. Harris went after Trump's criminal record. I was the elected attorney general, as I've mentioned, of California. And before that, I was a courtroom prosecutor. In those roles, I took on perpetrators of all kinds. Predators who abused women. Fraudsters who ripped off consumers. Cheaters who broke the rules for their own gain. So hear me when I say, I know Donald Trump's type. So Harris has revealed her hand. It was really a no-brainer. Kamala Harris used to serve as a prosecutor. Donald Trump is a convicted felon. It's a, it's a strategy that writes itself. But strategy alone does not win elections. For that, you need money and support. The first one, money, does not seem to be a problem. Kamala Harris has inherited Biden's war chest. Plus, she's on a fundraising spree. Guess how much money she's raised since Sunday? More than $100 million. So clearly, Democratic supporters are enthusiastic. Even celebrities are joining in. Spike Lee, John Legend, Mike Hamill, Cardi B, Viola Davis, and Mark Ruffalo. Now, Hollywood support could be key for Harris. They're often called an ATM for Democrats. But more importantly, they could add momentum to the campaign. You see, Trump has been campaigning since last year. Kamala Harris only has 100 days left, so she has a lot of ground to cover. Enter celebrity supporters, and the message is amplified. The Harris campaign knows this. On Sunday, British pop star Charlie XCX endorsed Harris. And she did so in a weird way, by writing, Harris is Brat. Now, Brat doesn't mean what you think here. It's the name of Charlie's hit album. So she was actually endorsing Harris. That post has gotten 48 million views on X. It's been liked more than three, 300,000 times. So the campaign immediately latched onto it. They have fully embraced the Brat tag. And what does that mean? What does the tag mean? Someone who doesn't fit the gender, typical gender stereotype. Someone who's honest and blunt. Someone who likes to party and someone who's often messy. Sort of like a good rebel. You can see why Kamala Harris is embracing this message. Neither Trump nor Biden could connect to young voters, but Harris can. So she's going all in with pop culture. What about the other side? The primary message from Trump and Vance is this. Biden was bad. Harris will be worse. Now, history will remember Joe Biden as not just a quitter, which he is, but one of the worst presidents in the United States of America. But my friends, Kamala Harris is a million times worse, and everybody knows it. There is a parallel campaign, too. A lot of sexism, racism, and conspiracy theories. J.D. Vance is part of it, too. An old video of his is going viral. Vance can be heard calling Harris a childless cat lady. Listen to this. Is that we're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs, by a bunch of childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and the choices that they've made. And so they want to make the rest of the country miserable, too. Of course, this is a bitter campaign, so things will get ugly. But attacking someone's gender or race is just pathetic. Harris wasn't exactly a popular veep. Her track record is also questionable, so why not focus on that? 
Plus, what's with all the conspiracy theories? The latest one is that Joe Biden is dead. A lot of Republicans are pushing this theory. Why? Because he hasn't been seen since the weekend. I'll admit it is strange. As a U.S. president, you cannot go missing for days. You must make appearances, especially after dropping bombshell decisions. But common sense says Biden is not dead. In fact, Biden joined Harris's campaign event on phone call. It is so good to hear our president's voice. Joe, I know you're still on the, on the call, and we've been talking every day. Um, you probably, you guys heard it from Doug's voice. We love Joe and Jill. We really do. They truly are like family to us. And we do, everybody here does. It's mutual. <laughs> I knew you were still there. You're not going anywhere, Joe. Oh, I'm watching you, kid. <laughs> I'm watching you, kid. I love you. I love you, Joe. Oh. Exciting for the neutrals, not so much for Americans. This is definitely shaping up to be a great fight. We can't wait for the results. Or should I say, the series finale. Let's turn to the war in Gaza. It has led to something unprecedented among Palestinians. Unity. And guess who's forged this unity? China. I know it sounds confusing, so let me explain. Palestinians control two pieces of land, Gaza, which is ruled by Hamas, and the West Bank, which is ruled by the Palestinian Authority, or PA. Now, the PA is controlled by a political party. It's called Fateh. The party is, this is the party of late Yasser Arafat. Fateh and Hamas have been rivals since the year 2007. That's when they fought a civil war in Gaza. Hamas calls for violence against Israel, but Fateh prefers politics. And their rivalry has weakened the Palestinian cause. But maybe not for long, because Hamas and Fateh have signed a unity deal. Both groups were in China for talks. They held discussions for three days. And at the end of it, they signed a deal. We are signing an agreement for national unity to say that the way to continue this path is our national unity. And that's why we are adhering to our national unity. We call for it, and we won't let anything affect this national unity. We have sought a lot to seek help in this world to stop this injustice against the Palestinian people to no avail. We've had decisions issued from all the international institutions, but we can't find a way to implement these decisions. They're calling it the Beijing Declaration. It's been in the works for a while. China first hosted Hamas and Fateh in April. That meeting laid the groundwork for this deal. But what does it say? Mainly four things. Number one, creating an interim unity government for Palestine. Number two, creating a unified Palestinian leadership. Number three, holding fresh elections. And number four, a declaration of unity against Israel. Now, these are all big decisions. Hamas and Fateh are agreeing to share power, to rule together. If this experiment succeeds, it could boost the Palestinian movement. But what's in it for China? For starters, image building. Beijing wants to position itself as a negotiator, as an agent of peace. We saw that last year as well. They brokered a deal between Iran and Saudi Arabia. Now they have united Fateh and Hamas. So clearly, China is improving its mediating chops. Secondly, it creates goodwill for China. Arab states have long tried to mediate between Hamas and Fateh, but none of them succeeded. So chances are they will welcome China's effort, because thanks to Beijing, the old rivalry seems to be over. And they're not done yet. China's foreign minister presided over the talks and the signing. Afterwards, he had a message. China is ready to push for peace in West Asia. China is willing to strengthen communication and coordination with all relevant parties to jointly implement the Beijing Declaration reached today and to play a constructive role in maintaining peace and stability in the Middle East. Could that be China's next target, a peace deal between Israel and Hamas? Well, that depends on Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. He is in the United States right now. He will meet Joe Biden later today. And tomorrow he will address the U.S. Congress. Now, Biden did not invite Netanyahu. The Republican House Speaker invited him. In fact, Netanyahu and Biden have been growing apart. Biden wants him to take a ceasefire deal, but Netanyahu wants to push on with the war. The question is, will the campaign chaos in Washington affect any of this? 
Well, two things are possible. Biden doesn't have a campaign to run, so he can put more pressure on Netanyahu. No worries about Jewish voters. That's one possibility. But Biden's replacement is his vice president. So his actions will affect Kamala Harris too. And that may weaken his hand against Netanyahu. So which way will Joe Biden go? We'll know during the press conference later today. But Netanyahu did drop a hint in Washington. He said a hostage deal was near. We are determined to bring them all back. The conditions to bring them back are ripening, for the simple reason that we are putting very, very strong pressure on Hamas and we are seeing a certain change, and I think this change will grow and we intend to do it, this is a war goal. It's a contrast, isn't it? Netanyahu and Biden at odds. Meanwhile, China uniting Fatah and Hamas. It's definitely a diplomatic coup for Beijing, but one big worry still remains. Will this unity deal survive? Here's why we ask. You see, Fatah and Hamas are fundamentally opposites. Plus, there is a lot of global opposition to Hamas. They, after all, carried out the October 7th attack. They slaughtered innocent Israeli citizens. So anyone who comes close to Hamas will feel the heat. Does Fatah really want to risk that? Also, what happens when Hamas launches another attack? Will Fatah stand by and condone it? Or will they distance themselves? These are all concerns around this unity deal. As for the U.S., all is not lost. A Hamas-Israel peace deal remains the holy grail. Whoever seals that will get the bragging rights. Let's talk about the European Union now. It is boycotting Hungary and its leader, Viktor Orban. Brussels is upset over Orban's recent peace mission. He visited Ukraine and Russia. Orban is trying to play peacemaker and broker a truce between them, Ukraine and Russia. But Brussels did not approve of these trips. It says Viktor Orban is engaging in rogue diplomacy. And what is their response? The bloc's top diplomat has asked EU nations to boycott a meeting in Hungary. Instead, Brussels is hosting a rival summit. Our next report has more details. Orban had it all planned. He travelled to Ukraine, Russia and China. He shook hands with all the leaders. He even had Hollywood-style videos made for this so-called peace mission. Orban wanted to make a statement that he'd arrived at the world stage, declaring himself Europe's de facto leader. Hungary currently holds the presidency of the European Council. It's a rotating seat, meaning everyone gets a turn to serve on this post. But Orban is taking this job a bit more seriously than his EU counterparts. He's using this opportunity to play peacemaker and negotiating an end to the war in Ukraine. In that spirit, he advised Ukraine to accept a ceasefire. I asked the President Volodymyr Zelensky to think about whether we could reverse the order and speed up peace talks with making a ceasefire first. But Brussels didn't take kindly to the proposal. They were quick to give it a cold shoulder. Turns out, Orban didn't bother to discuss his peace plan with his European counterparts. The Hungarian leader bypassed the European Union, as well as the United States. Instead of Washington, D.C., Orban took his peace mission to Mar-a-Lago, where he met with the Republican candidate Donald Trump. Orban thinks that Trump is in a better position to end the war in Ukraine. Thank God that Trump did not allow himself to be killed. I hope that this means that God has plans with the president. And what other plan could God have in such warlike times than someone bringing peace at last? And he was the president of peace. This time, Orban really has crossed the line, according to Brussels. They've started a mission to boycott him. Orban was supposed to host a meeting in Budapest in his official role. These were informal talks. Foreign and defense ministers from Europe were expected to attend. Now, they'll be jetting off to Brussels instead. The EU's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell, is hosting a rival meeting there. He's making moves to shut down Orban's peace mission. I will call for a restricted session, ministers only, 
in order to discuss what has happened in the last weeks from the visits to Moscow, uh, to Kiev and to Pekin from, my, from Prime Minister Orban and the speeches at the United Nations Security Council from his foreign minister uh, accusing the European Union to be the country or the, the union that pushes for war. This is completely unacceptable. Brussels hopes that this rival meeting will show European unity. Instead, it's likely to expose Europe's differences. With Orban and Brussels heading straight for a showdown. Now let's turn our attention to Africa, to the country of Uganda. Uganda is home to almost 50 million people, and at least some of those people seem to have been inspired by their neighbors in Kenya. Because like the Kenyans, the Ugandans have also decided to protest. There was supposed to be a massive demonstration today. Young Ugandans had planned to march to their parliament building in the capital, Kampala. They wanted to protest against endemic corruption in their country. Their target was a senior government official, Anita Among, Uganda's Speaker of Parliament. I want Anita Among to resign. She has stolen from this country. These resources are not hers. This is taxpayers' money. I am urging all the young people out there in Uganda to come out with large numbers and protest. The protesters believe that Uganda's parliament speaker is corrupt, and they aren't the only ones. Anita Among has been under the scanner globally. The U.S. sanctioned her earlier this year for quote-unquote significant corruption. The U.K. did the same. Among was accused of misusing public resources and diverting materials from Uganda's neediest communities. That is what the U.S. said. And it seems that the people of Uganda agree. We are tired of corruption and it has to be resigned. We are tired, we are tired. No, no drugs in the hospitals, bad roads. Kampala is the pothole capital, bad roads. It's because of corruption. The protest in Uganda seems to have been inspired by the recent demonstrations in Kenya. Kenyans have been protesting for weeks on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Now the Ugandans are following suit. Protesters in both countries call for a march to parliament to put pressure on the authorities. And both movements have been organized at the grassroots, mostly by young people or the Gen Z. Those are the similarities. But while they are neighbors, Uganda and Kenya are very different countries. Kenya is a democracy. Uganda has been ruled by one man for almost four decades. This man, Yoveri Museveni. He became president in 1986 and he's been there ever since, since 1986. His son is now the chief of Uganda's defense forces and seems to be the heir apparent. Does that sound like a democratic setup to you? So you won't be surprised to learn that Uganda does not like protests. When the demonstrations were announced, the government swung into action. Museveni warned the protesters that they were quote-unquote playing with fire. The police said they would not tolerate disorderly conduct. And they started making preparations for today. Both the police and the military were deployed in the capital. There were security patrols, roads were checked, Kampala looked like a war zone. Politicians from an opposition party were arrested, their party headquarters were surrounded to stop the protesters from getting any support. But despite all of this, some Ugandans still came out today and they faced the full force of the regime. There was police brutality, Dozens of protesters were detained. Some others seem to have been abducted outright. All this sends a chilling message to the protesters that Uganda will not tolerate dissent, no matter the reason. Museveni will not budge. Will today's crackdown end the protests before they truly begin? Or will it spark an even bigger fire? We'll find out in a few days. Now let's talk about something that could be Hollywood's next big hit. Cocaine sharks. It may so sound like another Jaws installment, but this is real. And swimming near the coast of Brazil. 
13 sharks there have tested positive for cocaine. It's the first such study and the results are quite dramatic. Now the question is, how did cocaine enter the bodies of sharks? Experts have a few theories, but all of them point to just one culprit, humans. Our next report explains. It's a plot twist that would make Hollywood screenwriters blush. Sharks off the coast of Brazil have tested positive for cocaine. Yes, you heard that right, cocaine. These aquatic predators have taken a dive into the drug trade. Not as smugglers or victims of cartels, but as unwitting participants. It started when marine biologists tested 13 Brazilian sharp-nosed sharks. They were taken from the shores near Rio de Janeiro. What they find was literally jaw-dropping. High levels of cocaine were detected in all 13 sharks, especially in their muscles and livers. The concentration was a staggering 100 times higher than previously reported in other marine creatures. So what explains this? Does the world's apex predator have an addiction problem? Do they need rehab with motivational posters saying, just keep swimming? Or is it something more? Now, experts don't know for sure yet, but they believe sharks are unwilling participants in Brazil's drug trade. One theory says the cocaine has made its way to the waters via illegal drug labs, or even the excrement of drug users. Other theories say cocaine lost or dumped by traffickers at sea could be the culprit. Either way, the sharks are consuming it, which could be potentially worrying. All the females in the study were pregnant, but it's yet to be seen how it will affect the fetuses. The scientists haven't noticed anything strange yet, but they believe it's affecting their eyesight. Now, this isn't the first time drug compounds were found in ocean water. Last year, benzolecconine was detected in samples taken off the coast of the UK. It's a byproduct of cocaine metabolism. Other sea creatures like crabs, shrimp and oysters have had traces of cocaine, amphetamines and MDMA in their systems. So it turns out that the ocean is becoming the world's largest drug den. But it's also a surreal reminder that human actions have far-reaching impacts, even on creatures we don't think we affect. These sharks are caught in a global environmental crisis. So next time you're enjoying a beach holiday in Brazil, don't worry about the sharks. They're probably more interested in their next fix than in you. The midlife crisis. It comes for all of us. And the stressors are not unique. Caretaking, job pressures, declining health. But if you're in China, add one more item to your list. Retirement. China has one of the world's lowest retirement ages. Middle age is the prime time to prepare for retirement. Women can leave the workforce at 50 and men at 60. This is about six years below most developed economies and Beijing now wants to change this. It wants to raise the retirement age. Estimates say the new golden number could be 65. There is no clarity though, except on this, that China is desperate. And it is going for the lowest hanging fruit, pushing the retirement age. We'll tell you why. First reason, China has a declining birth rate. Last year, it reached a historic low, so fewer births and a rapidly aging population. This leads to the second reason. China's active workforce is shrinking. Fewer people are entering the workforce, more people are retiring. And this is fueling the third factor, dwindling coffers. People who retire get a pension from state-backed funds. But as the workforce shrinks, fewer people are contributing to the pension funds. So within the next decade, the pension system will run out of money. Long story short, Beijing is bleeding money and for once acknowledging the problem. But how are the people taking it? Well, they are angry. This move was long overdue, but critics say implementing it is like taking the easy way out. The unemployment rate is surging in China. Education and childcare costs are high. Gender discrimination is pervasive, so fewer people want to get married and couples don't want children. Hence the population crisis. That is the root problem. China is failing to solve it. And now that the money is drying up, they want a band-aid solution, a higher retirement age. Well, it may help but only so much. And this challenge is not unique to China, really. Across the world, people are living longer. 
In the year 2000, global life expectancy was 67 years. By 2019, it increased to 73. By 2050, one in six people will be 65 years or older, meaning more people will, li will leave the workforce than enter it. More people will leave the workforce than enter it. The workforce will shrink. So many countries are rethinking the retirement age. From an economic standpoint, a later retirement age has its benefits. It is good for the government. But let's put the finances aside for a bit. Does it benefit the people? What are the mental and physical implications? One way to answer this is not by looking at lifespans, but at health spans, meaning how long can you actually work for? After the age of 45, brain function starts to reduce. After the age of 60, there is a significant decline in cognitive function, most noticeably in memory. This is the broad trend, and this is bound to impact work. So even if you can continue to work, should you continue to work? The answer will depend on the kind of work you do, how sharp you stay at your age, and your financial situation. All of these factors matter. The rich can always choose to retire, but the poor have to work until their body gives up. There are other problems as well. Assuming that the retirement age is pushed to, say, 67, and let's say you do want to work, will companies want to hire you? If yes, great. If no, you're not only unemployed, you also lose out on your pension. So it's all subjective, really. There are a lot of what-ifs, but there is no ideal age for retirement. In countries like Iceland and Norway, the retirement age is 67, which is the highest in the world. Saudi Arabia has the lowest retirement age at 47 years. Then you have Asian countries like India and South Korea, where retirement age is between the late 50s and early 60s. But people work even in their late 60s. So every country has its own story. Having said that, they, they all face the same challenge, rethinking the retirement number, a reform that everyone will have to think about at some point. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. Paris was witness to a celestial treat when the moon passed through the Olympic rings on the Eiffel Tower. In Italy, an airport shuts down because of volcanic ash after yet another Mount Etna eruption. And baggage piles up at the Denver airport as Delta cancels 600 flights amid cyber outage. Finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day in 1952, the Egyptian monarchy was toppled in a coup. It was engineered by the Free Officers, a nationalistic military group led by Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser. They overthrew King Farouk I of Egypt, ending the monarchy and bringing Nasser to power. We're leaving you on that note. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.
Across continents, one powerful news source. Bringing you diverse perspectives on the issues that matter. We go beyond the boundaries to give you that little extra about every sporting moment. So thank you for making First Post 5 million strong. We're counting on your support and you can trust us to bring you the news unfiltered and unvarnished. Climate change is on our doorstep. It's time for a revolution to take root. And it starts with 1.4 billion Indians. It starts with one tree. One tree for humanity. One tree for Mother Earth. One tree for our future. Project One Tree. A News 18 Network initiative. Hello and welcome to First Post America. I'm Eric Ham, coming to you live from the nation's capital. 